Welcome everyone to the April 17th uh, City Council work session. Welcome to everyone here and at home. Um, we have three big items to discuss today, so um, encouraging us all to have um, minimal stuff on our committee reports and items of interest. Uh, if there's anything that somebody needs to, to bring up now on that, we can do that first. Seeing none. You mean the committee reports? Yeah. Yes, well, I, I want to make a, uh, use my time for the committee report to make a motion, All right. extended motion. All right. But before I do that, I have a question for the manager. Okay. And my question is, have you read Mr. Roberts's letter to the Wayne Metro Partnership Board? Is that the one that he sent uh, that he an sent email? To, yeah. I have. And would you describe any statements made in that letter as being misleading or inaccurate or untruthful? You know, I'd have to go back and look at that uh, for sure and take a look at that. <laughs> well, this is the motion. I was going to do it last and wait until people gave their reports, but if no one's going to do that, I'll go ahead and make my motion. All right. Because we value a government that is open, transparent, and accountable, Council moves to direct the City Manager to direct the City Attorney to examine any electronic or verbal communications held outside of public meetings by any elected or appointed government official regarding the status of Mr. Jack Roberts' continued employment as the Director of the Lane Metro Partnership and to provide to the Council as soon as practicable an opinion whether any official from the governmental jurisdictions that provide financial support to the Lane Metro Partnership or any person otherwise connected to the Lane Metro Partnership may have violated public meeting laws regarding said communications. And I'll speak to it if I get a second. 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 Moved and seconded. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank Mr. Roberts for his courage and his honesty in admitting his mistake in his letter to the Lane Metro Partnership Board. I think it's very commendable and I'm glad that he brought this matter out of the back rooms into the light of day. Um, the Lane Metro Partnership Board never conducted a formal review of Mr. Roberts' performance as a director, nor otherwise expressed any desire for a leadership change. Similarly, to my knowledge, the Lane County Board of Commissioners never publicly discussed the desirability of a leadership change at Lane Metro Partnership. Yet we learned that the county's economic development manager privately approached Lane Metro Partnership's board officers to essentially dictate terms of a leadership change at Lane Metro Partnership that had never been publicly discussed. All of this is highly irregular. There, there's several other problems that, that I have with this that I won't list here, but those, these are the main ones. All of this is highly irregular, to say the least. City Council needs to shed some light on this matter, and that is the reason for my motion. And I would ask that Councillor Poling recuse himself for obvious conflicts of interest. Other comments? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, George? First of all, I don't believe there is a conflict of interest. Uh, there's no monetary gain that my wife is seeking from the Lane Metro Partnership, nor is she being paid by the Lane Metro Partnership. She has not been asked to do anything with the Lane Metro Partnership other than I believe she was asked, if necessary, to step in as an interim director as a county employee until the Metro Partnership Board selects a new executive director, if that's the route they take. Um, I'm Again, here we are blindsided by an 11th hour motion that I had no, no nobody had any knowledge of prior to this meeting. We have continually tried to avoid doing that. Uh, I think this is wrong, uh, bringing it up like this in this fashion. We don't know what this is going to cost. And so to me, the request that's being made is similar to the request that uh, Rob Handy did with the uh, shotgun approach to getting emails from, from Lane County and, and went to court and tried to sue the county over it and was tossed out by the courts. To base a motion on one side of the argument is totally wrong is short-sighted and I don't think we have as a city council the power or the jurisdiction to go snooping into the city of Springfield or Lane County's email system to find out if any person 
had any communication, that's going to take forever. I, I think this is politically motivated. I think it's wrong. And I don't know, I'll wait for an, an opinion from, uh, from the council or from uh, legal on that, but I don't believe I have a conflict of interest. You want to say something, Glenn? Um, I, I can certainly answer that part. In terms of the motion that is presently before the council, you do not have a conflict of interest because all this this motion has nothing to do with your wife. This motion has to do with whether uh, a governmental entity has violated the public meetings law. As to whether there could be a conflict if you are on the Metro Board and the Metro Board is taking up something, I don't have enough facts to answer that question, but certainly in terms of this motion, um, you do not have a conflict of interest, not an actual one, not a potential one. Thank you. Uh, I've got George Brown, Claire, Greg, and Mike. Well, um, as far as I'll address the 11th hour thing first. You know, uh, the, the extended uh, article in the newspaper today raised so many questions in my mind, uh, in addition to reading Mr. Roberts's letter that was forwarded to all of us. So, you know, I, I can't control when the newspaper article is going to come out. It came out. And so they got me thinking. Um, there is a conflict of interest because the intended motion states that it, it, verbal, communi verbal or electronic communications held outside of public meetings by any elected or appointed government official. Appointed. That would include the to the economic development director of Lane County. That person was appointed. She was hired. Difference. I can put that in here. I can change my motion if you want to put that in there. If we want to, if we want to pick nets. Basically, what happened here was there were all kinds of conversations out of school. Not before the the Lane Metro Partnership Board of Directors. Not before the Lane County commissioners meetings here in this hall that's the problem here there was lots of discussion in back rooms but none in the light of public day that th this motion addresses that and seeks to shed some light on these dealings that occurred and none of us knew about it until we read the newspaper or read mr. Roberts's letter that's improper that works totally against the idea of an open and transparent government that's why I made this motion. So um, it also says, <laughs> and I think we have a responsibility to shed some light on this. I think it's really important that we do that. Because if we just drop this, it can happen again, it can happen again, it can happen again. So. I'm asking people to support this motion, and I repeat my request to Councillor Poling to recuse himself. Thank you. So, just to um, before I call the next people, just to clarify this, we can't, we don't have the power to 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 look into the uh, county commissioners' emails. Um. You have the ability, and I was going to point out, I was going to wait till the conversation was further along. Um, you have the ability to request the city manager. You can't direct the manager to tell particular staff to do anything under the charter. You can request that he do this. Um, and you could request that he conduct some kind of investigation. Um, we have the same ability as uh, anybody else in making a public records request. Um, and so we could ask for emails. The county would be entirely within its purview of saying, okay, uh, if you want those emails, then here's what it's going to cost and here's how long it's going to take. We have no subpoena powers, um, but we could do a public records request. Uh, and so in terms of written communications, we could ask for those. In terms of verbal communications, unless by <coughs> verbal you mean other written communications other than emails, you know, certainly any oral conversations that people have had, there's no way to go look at those because there's nothing to look at. It would just be a question of whether anybody has notes or something like that. We can make those kinds of requests, but as you saw from the litigation and the newspapers talking about 
how much it cost the county, and it's the same for us. If we made a public records request for um, any emails or other um, documents that the county has, um, or if I'm reading this correctly, this would also be that the city of Eugene has, or the Metro Board has, or the city of Springfield has, um, related to any conversations about Jack Roberts and his uh, staying or leaving, then that's going to be a very broad public records request and it's going to be a very expensive one um, for us to pay for those. Um, we can certainly ask. So we do have the legal authority to make that public records request. That's how we would seek to get the information if the council asks <coughs> the motion. Claire? <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I, I appreciate, appreciate Councillor Brown's concern about transparency. Um, but I have to say, at, at this point, I don't see the urgency of putting this motion forward right now in this manner, where we're all still absorbing what we've read. Um, again, what's reported in the paper is not necessarily what has happened, as some of us know from uh, media coverage, not to, uh, you know, suggest that our uh, reporter is, is misrepresenting. But, you know, we just don't always know what exactly has happened. And I just don't see the urgency for us to take up this matter in this way. I also don't know that it's the right role for this council to um, uh, try to perform this kind of investigation. Um, you know, I would rather wait and see how things play out, what else uh, Mr. Roberts has to say about the situation, what the county has to say, um, and, and go from there. I, I just don't, I think it's far too early in this situation to assert that there was some kind of um, wrongdoing on anyone's behalf and I frankly don't know enough about the agency and how it's staffed and who's responsible for that to say that I want to call for an investigation of that so I will not be supporting this motion. Gray? Uh, thank you Mayor. Um, I too concur with uh, what uh, Councilor Surrett just said. Uh, I, I think that this is uh, premature. Um, I think it's rushed. Um, I think we need a lot more facts before we uh, make any kind of approach in terms of uh, a quote unquote investigation, if you will. I just read Jack's letter last night and um, I haven't had time to absorb it. I haven't even read the paper this morning. So I don't know what that report was. So I won't be supporting this motion either uh, because I just don't have enough information to uh, determine whether there's a nefarious intent here in terms of the uh, situation or not. Mike? Thank you, Mayor. I agree with both Claire and Greg. And I, uh, George, I understand your, your point with regard to transparency and appreciate it. Um, I, I shared also the sense of reading that and not feeling very good about what I read. Um, in the manner in which the situation developed. But the reality is, what was discussed in the article I read was what the county would or wouldn't do in the future. And I'm not sure that's really our jurisdiction. Now, what I read of what our jurisdiction said was that the manager has already decided and proposed in his upcoming budget proposal to fund Lane Metro Partnership. Now, whether they keep Mr. Roberts or don't is certainly up to their board. And so I, I don't understand where our purview begins to investigate something about conversations that took place well in advance of the actual elected authorities making a decision about whether or not to fund the organization. So whether or not Lane Metro Partnership gets the money that they have gotten in past years and I sense that based on what I read and what I know I I sense they probably will I sense they'll probably be funded and that mr. Roberts will likely remain based on what I read and what I've heard some people say and were there discussions about how to grow and move into the future I, I think that's natural understanding the the state of the county government at this time and their finances they're looking for new and innovative ways to do things um, but I, I don't sense that, although the lack of transparency troubles me, I don't sense that there was some kind of wrongdoing by anybody on our staff in any way. So I, I 
like my colleagues here, I, I don't understand our our urgency in acting or directing the manager to act at this time. I think it's a little premature. And as George mentioned, I too am a little concerned about dropping in a motion without at least an email or a notification of intent to do so, which is how we typically handle a, a, a newsworthy piece of information that affects all of us and all of us are concerned about. So I would have liked to seen some notice of it as well. Thank you. Chris? I I can appreciate that um, there's questions. And, and I think, like George, um, when you have questions, you, you want them answered. I think transparency is one aspect, but I think having a lot of questions and reading a story in the paper or reading something in email and going, wow, this raises a lot of questions is definitely <laughs> a, a valid point. The, the idea, though, is these questions are raised about different jurisdictions. And this is kind of to Mike's point. The city council for the city of Eugene is responsible for the city of Eugene. And we really are not responsible for being in a supervisory position over the county or the city of Springfield, because this would also include the city of Springfield. Mm -hmm. And I'm very concerned about the city of Eugene appearing to take on the role of policing the emails or, or reviewing or whatever you want to call it for the Lane County and for the city of Springfield, because we would also be going to the city of Springfield and asking for their, this as any elected or appointed official, and they're part of the funding mechanism. So you're talking Lane County, you're talking Springfield, and, in, and any other bodies that are involved in, in funding. And to me, I think that's moving outside the appropriate role for the Eugene City Council. Now, with, the, with regard to questions, if there's a question with regard to the City of Eugene, did the City of Eugene have any sort of a role in what's been happening here? Of course, that would be something worthwhile. I don't know if we need to go to this degree of having a resolution to do that. I could simply say, could you put a memo together saying here's what the city of Eugene has been involved in around this discussion? Would answer questions within the area that we are appropriately involved in and doesn't start pushing us out into areas that I don't think is appropriate for us to be involved in. Uh, yeah, sure, I would love to have answers. I think it's reasonable to say we, we should have answers, but our answers need to be appropriate to the city of Eugene and the city of Eugene's role, not Lane County or the city of Springfield or, or anyone. Or anyone else. That's not that's not our job. Betty, thanks. I just want to comment on a couple of things. One thing: it is because we contribute to the Metro Partnership. It, I think their business is our business, and if we decided not to contribute anymore, that would be another matter. Um, and I think also emails. All our emails are public. That's. They're, they're not private if you if you do a city email it if there's no um, guarantee there's no reason no reason to think it's going to be private as some people have found out sometimes over the over the years I even remember one about the food at some restaurant that got somebody in tr <laughs> trouble um, but and about making a motion on the fly I think we, d we decided at one point, since I've been on the council, to try to let people know ahead of time, but we do have the right to make a motion at any time if we just just learn about something or just decide we're concerned about something, if a constituent brings up something, we do have a right to make a motion without telling anyone ahead of time. They have a right to not vote for it if they don't want to, but that's all I have to say right now. Okay, we got George Brown. And Alan, are you there? Alan? I don't hear no, Alan. I heard so noise from that. George Brown and then Greg, and then we want to try to wrap this up. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I apologize if I gave the impression that I want the city attorney to go on an endless fishing expedition. That's not the intent at all. I can add language that specifies. I'm, I'm interested in March 27th, the meeting between Mr. Roberts, our city manager, the city manager of Springfield and the Lane County administrator, when he discussed... Uh, his proposal to resign and the conditions for that and I'm interested in any meetings that um, the Lane County <coughs> Economic Development Manager may have had with the uh, board officers of Lane Metro Partnership before April 11th. I want to, I'm narrowing it down. I don't want to know. We don't need to know every email communication of the Lane County Administrator or every email communication of the Springfield City Manager. It 
should be directed to meetings and discussions and emails that occurred outside of public meeting. That's my concern. I think a lot of conversation went on. We were never aware of it. The Springfield City Council was never aware of it. The Lane County Board of Commissioners may or may not have been aware. But it appears from, from what I've read that at least some of the commissioners were possibly aware of these these, these um, kind of out-of-school communications. That's what I'm suggesting. I'm not suggesting a Warren Commission three-year investigation. Uh, it can be very, it can be very specific. That's. I will leave that to the city attorney's discretion and his good judgment. That's what I'm suggesting by this. I'm not. I'm not seeking to have a a big scandal or anything. I'm not even suggesting that there was wrongdoing. I would like to, there, there's the appearance of wrongdoing, in my view. So I'm suggesting that he look at this, narrow it down to a few dates, see what went on, report back to us, provide an opinion whether anyone may have, that's what it says in the, in, in the motion, may have. That also means may not have violated public meeting rules that's all this does it's not it's not a a, a a fishing expedition with no end that's not what I'm proposing at all because you're right that would be very expensive uh, I don't think it would serve any good purpose I think it should be narrowly focused to provide us with some answers because like Councillor Taylor said we are one of the funding partners of the Lane Metro Part Partnership thank you George Alan, do you have anything? Did you want to say anything? Uh, yeah, Mayor. Uh, at, at this point, um, I think this motion is uh, premature, so I'll be uh, uh, interested to find out how it unfolds. But at this time, I'm not going to support it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Greg. Uh, yeah, just just real briefly. Um, if I re re remember correctly, the Lane Metro Partnership has a board, mm -hmm. and I think that. That's the appropriate place for any kind of um, investigation or inquiry into what happened. That needs to be the body that actually needs to deal with that. Um, and secondly, you know, I, I, I'm concerned about you know us sending the manager, you know, to do this with a number of things that are coming up that we have to grapple with. That is more in line with city business and not necessarily with the Metro Partnership. So I don't want to be wasting time or resources. I just, I think that we need to, um, you know, not support this motion and move on and let the Metro Partnership Board handle this and take care of it, which I think uh, we have a counselor or two on that board. So um, I'm going to wrap this up with Mike. Thank you, Mayor. I. Mr. City Attorney, perhaps you can help me with this, but m my understanding of public meetings law, as mentioned by my colleague, as the the primary concern is, were there any violations of the public meetings law? Is what I'm I'm hearing. Um, my understanding is that relates predominantly to elected officials as opposed to staff members. Would I have that right? Correct. So, in other words, the only time that law is really at issue is whether an elected person is deciding the public's business in the full light of day as opposed to staff people and folks who are in, in hired positions for those uh, uh, government entities who have and should be meeting with their counterparts and other parallel organizations to work out long-term plans. Um, generally true just to clarify it's I, not just elected officials um, the Planning Commission I mean you you sure. appoint um, commissions those are also subject to the public meetings laws right. on the other hand um, when the city manager meets with his executive team right. um, or he meets with his counterparts those are not public meetings they're not subject to the public meetings law and the reason is because when the final decision is made it should be made in the full light of day with the discussion of everybody who's a publicly elected person. And in this case, what we're talking about is the budget for that particular organization, I think, as I understand it, which we're not, we haven't gotten to yet. 
and will be the case where we have plenty of public discussions as the budget rolls out for both the city and the county but I'm hearing predominantly the focus is around the county's budget and what elected county people may or may not know or be involved in and, and as has been stated I, I don't think that's our jurisdiction so I'm I'm not interested in in pursuing information of, on what other jurisdictions may or may not have done I am interested very much in what we do as an elected body um, and, and the direction and leadership of our staff. But I, as has been said, I think this may be both premature and, and not clearly in our bailiwick. I'm going to go to a vote now. Um, what I, I'd like to make one more brief comment, Mayor. Thank you. Um, it's, it has nothing to do with the budget discussions. It has everything to do with discussions out of school about leadership changes and um, I know I see how the votes gonna go but I would just like to request uh, all you guys to at some point in the future you tell me when you think it'd be a good time for us to bring this up again so I, what I am going to suggest we're gonna vote on this but what I'm gonna suggest right now is um, the city manager provide a memo to sort of update you on the um, on the conversations that have taken place. I, I, I think he feel fine about doing that. And then I'm going to suggest also that we, yeah. uh, separate from the budget discussion, is a discussion about how we want to go about doing our economic development work and what relationship we have with um, Metro over that. And that's probably a worthwhile conversation for you to have apart from the budget discussion. So I think we'll just sort of set both those up as soon as we can because you want to know we want to know the direction we want to go so I'll leave it at that so Mayor, I'd, Mayor, I'd like to table the vote table the motion for later okay discussion and second. I guess my there second is no has discussion. to approve there is no discussion okay. You need a, he, she, he needs a second, though, for a table. And Betty's second. And Betty second. All right. All those in favor of tabling, please indicate. Two in opposition. Oh. One, two, three, four, five. Allen? No. Six in opposition. It goes down. We're back to the main motion. May all, to make, uh, yeah. Just for clarification purposes, so there's no misguided accusations based on false information at a later time, I am casting votes on this issue based on my belief that there is no conflict of interest and also uh, from the uh, advice from uh, our council. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor of the motion, main motion, please indicate. Two in favor, in opposition. One, two, three, four, five. Alan? No. No. Six, it goes down. Thank you all. We'll move on to the next item now. I don't know if we're going to get through all these items now. We'll do our best. Okay, so what's new in downtown, City Manager? Uh, lots, and I'll ask Sarah Maderi and uh, the group to come on up. So. Takes a village. <laughs> Dodgeball? That will be my champion. As long as there's dodgeball. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Over the last four years, city staff have increasingly coordinated and communicated activities and plans related to improving the downtown. This was directly in response to the City Council setting clear outcomes you wanted to see, which included, and this is just a few of them, a greater sense of safety, increased downtown development, support for small and large businesses, investing in arts and culture as an economic engine, and stronger partnerships between government entities. What you will see today is a direct result of our ongoing citywide effort to achieve those outcomes. The coordination effort has evolved over the years from a time where teams across the city really shared information to now where we're really coordinating and planning and implementing uh, work around downtown together. We've all strongly recognized that it's the mix of new activities, development, people, and public safety that is really weaving the vitality back into our downtown. Today's presentation will highlight the new things, small and large, that you will see, uh, you and the community can expect to see this summer as a result of the sustained leadership and focused efforts of the City Council, community, and staff. And I think Denny Bro is going to kick us off, and then we have Lieutenant Eric Klinko and Billy Moser. 
Thank you. Uh, again, uh, the, the topic for today is what's new downtown. And, and we're going to, again, team up and try to provide kind of a really exciting update on a lot of things that are going on downtown. Um, and, and as we look at all these, I guess uh, I, I'd like you to keep in mind um, that this really is all coming together in, the, in a perfect storm. And that perfect storm is, is uh, this summer as, as we're as going through uh, this topic. So I just uh, it's important to consider what the summer might look like. I'm going to start uh, by talking uh, about some infrastructure um, projects. And, and of course, infrastructure really is an important part of making downtown an attractive, safe, and an inviting place. And I'll just start a little bit about some public works things that are, are, are going to be going on downtown this summer. Um, basically, in the downtown core, there will be some street improvement projects really throughout the summer. Uh, they'll be focused along Fifth Avenue, um, pretty much from the stretch all the way, the stretch of Fifth that goes all the way through downtown and beyond to Blair Street. Uh, on Broadway, just west of downtown. Uh, on Tenth Avenue, west of Olive Street. And uh, also, uh, the South River uh, Bank uh, bike trail will undergo some improvements, basically from the DeFazio Bridge all the way through Skinner Butte Park this summer. And it's just important to recognize that uh, Public Works is doing a really good job of, of uh, checking in with all the stakeholder, stakeholders, really to try to minimize all the impacts of this construction as we go through the summer. Also in our facilities division, uh, there's a couple of uh, new things that are going on. Um, they're doing some really great work to make sure that downtown stays clean and attractive and inviting place. Um, a couple of things to note, we've uh, the facilities folks have acquired a new reclamation recycling pressure washer. Um, and really what that means is it's a more efficient uh, pressure washer, which basically means it recycles the water, but it also uh, has a lot more capacity. So really what that means is they can do more cleaning more frequently and be very energy efficient uh, in, in uh, not wasting water when they do that. So the end result w will be uh, we'll see a cleaner downtown, and that's, that's great. Um, also, um, sorry, also they'll uh, continue their tradition of um, hanging flower baskets, uh, flowers uh, throughout downtown, which has always uh, been a, a really great addition to how people experience downtown. But this year will be, uh, they'll be taking a greener approach, which basically means they'll be using less pesticides, reduced pesticides, uh, when they're uh, working on those flowers. The other things uh, that facilities folks have uh, uh, been working on is uh, electricity in the Kesey Plaza. Um, Kesey Plaza, of course, is a place for events and vendors and uh, the electrical system <coughs> standards. So they'll be installing uh, four sub panels that will really make uh, Kesey Plaza more easier to use and safer to use for events and food vendors, et cetera. Uh, we've done a lot of talking recently about investments that we've made downtown, particularly a lot of large projects that have happened downtown. Today I'd like to really shift the focus and talk a little bit about some of the outcomes that we're experiencing that are associated with those large projects. Um, really looking at some of the smaller things and really getting inside some of these projects to kind of report on what's happening inside these buildings and inside some of these projects that, that we've worked on. And I'm going to start with um, some new businesses that are bringing new employees downtown. Um, our story always tends to start at the Broadway Commerce Center. It's really the pioneering investment that most consider to have kind of kickstart kick all the momentum that we have downtown. I'm happy to report that the Broadway Commerce Center has 55,000 square feet of leasable square footage, and 50,000 square feet of that has been leased. Um, and first starting to look at kind of what's happening on, on the upper floors. Um, Beam had this vision of creating uh, flexible space uh, that would be attractive to creative knowledge-based companies, kind of where they would all coexist in kind of an incubator type environment. Um, and the nice thing is that this vision is actually being realized as we speak. Um, businesses such as P Pivot Architecture, Bell Funk, Florigenics, and Silico, Code Shops, Angle, Presidio are all populating the upper floors of uh, the Broadway Commerce Center. Recently, uh, Palo Alto Software um, has occupied the fifth floor, and they're in an expansion mode. 
uh, and they're expected to hit 45 employees here pretty soon. Uh, the newest tenant, uh, Intervision, which is a local production media company, uh, has leased space on the fourth floor, which was really the last floor that uh, uh, needed to uh, be filled. Um, and uh, as you can see, they've started construction on that space and should be moved in before this summer. Intervision is a, they're an existing local company. They do production media, basically all different forms of, of production media. Thank you. Uh, next door, the Woolworth Building. Um, also some good news to report, um, they've signed three new tenants. Um, one of them is 3D, or I'm sorry, 3C Interactive, uh, which is, um, they've already moved into the Woolworth building. Uh, it's important to note, or, 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 or noteworthy, that they have been recognized by Ford, Forbes magazine as the number one on the list of America's most promising companies. So that's cool that that's happening downtown. Um, Construction is also underway on two other spaces in the Woolworth building, which is, uh, would be, will be occupied by Avant Assessment, which is a local uh, language learning software company, and Hutchinson Cox, a, a local legal firm. Um, these three leases will bring the, the Woolworth building up to about 60% occupancy. Uh, there's also a new software company in the corner of Broadway, Olive Kitty Corner from the Broadworth, um, Broadway Commerce Center, uh, Fab Troll. Um, also, there's been a recent announcement, uh, the old Enterprise rental car space, uh, had, there's a, a lease signed by Sky, Sykes Industries, which will be a call center that will bring 400 new employees downtown, and they should be operating uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, the Northwest Community Credit Union, uh, they're currently work, working on their building design. They've made great progress working towards permits. Um, they should be under construction this summer. Um, and their new 68,000 square foot headquarters facility should be ready to be occupied in the fall of next year, bringing initially about 200 employees downtown, but this facility really has the capacity to uh, uh, accommodate an expansion up to about 300 plus employees. Of course, Lane Community College has opened uh, the new downtown center. There's approximately 6,000 students that go through courses and classes at the Lane Community Downtown Center. So it is a significant activity generated for, for the core of downtown. And importantly, that activity starts in the morning and goes well into the, into the evening hour. That's 6,000 a day? No, 6,000 uh, enrolled during the, the, the term of a year, yes. And I don't know how many uh, go through the day. We're trying to get that information, actually. but. Um, you know, the other thing that's really interesting, if you haven't had an opportunity to tour the facility from a green building perspective and really look at all of the systems uh, in the building, it's, it's truly fascinating. I would highly encourage it. Um, basically, um, uh, this is one of the most energy efficient commercial buildings in the entire state. And it's something that we should all really be proud of and recognize. And hopefully, you have an opportunity to go experience some of it. So, so moving on to uh, some of the retail activity is really what's happening on the ground floor. And the, the, the amount of new retail activity is, is as, as you might know if you walk around, significant. It's really like nothing we've seen if you look back the past 25 plus years. We really haven't experienced this kind of new retail activity. Walk around, you'll see a lot of, a lot of new construction. Uh, again, starting uh, with the Broadway Commerce Center on the ground floor. The ground floor is fully leased. Um, the barn light has opened with great success. They are busy morning, noon, and late into the evenings. A very popular destination. Uh, Sizzle Pie, uh, the pizza restaurant uh, from Portland, uh, their space is under construction on the corner, and they should be open before summer. Uh, Subis, uh, formerly the Rabbit Bistro, um, their space is under construction. They should also be open before summer begins. Other new retail scattered around downtown, um, there's the, the lumber company next to Voodoo Donuts, Off the Waffle in the U.S. Bank building, uh, Bon Me opened uh, soon after the Hawthorne Deli closed. There's a new clothing store, Young and Jones in the Parkade. Um, the retail space uh, associated with Broadway Place is filled up. Uh, so there's several new businesses, Moisette Pastry Kitchen, Bar 3 Fitness, Elbas Cosmetics. There's a new hair salon, a new Tokyo Japanese restaurant in Broadway Place. 
Um, the Oregon Temporary Theater is open on Broadway. Um, uh, very exciting. Um, uh, they were reporting that their first couple of productions in the new facility have been very successful. And most importantly, this activity that's generated by the, by the theater has really filled kind of a gap that's always existed for a long time between Olive Street and Broadway Place. And I think that has really helped stimulate some other interest on the block. The, the former Lord Liebrich Theater um, sold uh, half of their property, the, the east half, to uh, master development. And as you can see, uh, a major sh uh, facelift of that corner uh, is currently going on. And they hope to uh, attract some new, new retail tenants on that corner in the, in the near future. Probably the most significant transformation that you might see downtown is uh, first on Broadway, which is the former Taco Time building. Um, uh, you know, bringing back retail on this corner has been for a long time considered to be really critical for the overall retail success of, of Broadway and Willamette both. Um, and, and the good news is, is that it's, it's actually really happening. Um, the first National Tap House, um, if you haven't seen it, um, you should. It's, it's, it's very unique. I think it'll be a very unique experience from, you know, an exterior standpoint and definitely from an interior standpoint. Um, they will have a soft opening this weekend and probably be open within the next couple of weeks. Um, surely I think this is going to be a really popular destination for folks downtown. Uh, next door, the Bijou, uh, the Bijou Metro, which is the new downtown Bijou, Bijou, uh, Bijou is under construction. Uh, again, uh, uh, four screens uh, showing movies, and hopefully all of us will get out there this summer and watch movies downtown at the Bijou Metro. Next door to the Bijou, uh, also in First on Broadway, is um, Townsend Tea Company, which is a very popular Portland-based uh, tea retail business, and they are under construction. Uh, next door uh, to the, broad, the first on Broadway building, um, just across the alley from the Tap House is um, uh, a, a property that's currently being redeveloped. And it will house uh, two businesses, actually, two popular food carts, the Red Wagon Creamery and uh, Party Cart, um, both uh, uh, frequently recognized successful food carts. And they have partnered to fill this building that has been vacant, really predominantly vacant for for many years um, on the front half of that um, uh, you know there has been a significant void downtown for many years and that that is that we've had no ice cream um, and red, red we have donuts but no ice cream um, a red wagon creamery a great product uh, moving again from a food cart to a retail storefront they'll also be doing wholesale production so you might not only be able to buy ice cream here at the front door, but you might actually find it in, in one of your local stores and watch it be me. In the back, are, and this is uh, the office space, which is uh, also currently under construction, so a lot of construction going on. The back of that half of that building is uh, uh, the party cart, which they'll call uh, Party Downtown, which is a, will be a bistro, and they'll carry a lot of the very successful award-winning and recognized food that they currently offer in there in their cart. And the back half of that faces the U.S. Bank parking lot. Of course, if we uh, have ice cream, we have to have cupcakes. Um, recently opened Larry's Cupcakes on the park blocks, um, getting really good reviews and a popular destination. A lot of this uh, retail momentum that we have is also uh, causing some existing retailers to look at reinvesting or, or upgrading their facilities. The Davis is a good example. They've just undergone a, a major renovation of their interior and exterior space, and it looks fabulous. Um, another good example is Burnish Furniture, and some people may not have even recognized this yet, but um, this is our probably our oldest and largest retailer downtown, and they, they've undergone a major facelift that's really cleaned up and, and have an inviting storefront there on 10th. Um, the storefronts are, are really uh, not the only retail activity. There's also food cart activity that's going on, and um, uh, we have uh, seen some momentum. We have, um, you know, three to four food carts uh, in the plaza on a day. <coughs> we expect that to continue on throughout the summer, which is really a great addition to the plaza. I want to also talk a little bit about new residential activity downtown, bringing new residents downtown. And, and I'll start with Park Place. If you recall, we sold this property to Master Development. 
They created 24 apartment units, um, and I'm happy to report that they are fully leased, which is really, really a good indicator and really supports the ongoing theory that people want to live downtown and they'll seek out that housing if it's, if it's created. Um, Titan Court, uh, LCC Student Housing, has currently has 136 residents, and they, can, they expect that uh, many other units will be filled once the next term, which would be the, the fall term, um, and they're marketing for the fall, fall term currently. Uh, of course, the Capstone Project is currently under construction. They expect to have 379 beds available this September, 408 beds uh, available by this coming January, and another 521 beds available by next September 2014. Um, on f in the first on Broadway building on the second floor is uh, the Broadway lofts. Uh, again, um, uh, just a, an extraordinary transformation of a building that a lot of people gave no hope a couple of years ago. One of the really interesting things that they've done is, is brought back some of the history. Um, you know, the first national tap house is a reference to the first national bank that used to be there. Um, they've also found some remnants uh, of the old bank, and you can't really see it very well, but they found there's this old uh, bank safe, the first national bank safe in the basement. They brought it up to the first floor to kind of create a prominent entry to the residential space. Um, the second floor space is really, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, urban, it's cool, it's really unlike any other units you will find uh, in Eugene. So again, uh, this project has really kind of raised the bar, I, I think, for, for how uh, people are, will sp experience housing downtown. So. In conclusion, and, and as Sarah mentioned earlier, really at all levels of the or organization, we've had roles in almost all of these things that you've just I've just gone through, whether it be loans through our loan program, uh, shepherding them through the permit process, um, public safety issues, parking issues, beautification issues. Um, and it's really, really exciting, again, to think about what downtown is going to look like this summer. And just to put that in perspective, we'll, we'll, this summer we'll be able to experience at least 20 new retail businesses downtown in the core that weren't there two, two years ago. Uh, we'll be on a path that will bring over 1,500 residents to downtown. And also we'll be on a path to literally introduce hundreds of new employees downtown. So it's a really, really good time and I'm really happy to be here to talk about all of it. I'll pass it on. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Mayor and Council. I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk today about what I think are some of the really exciting developments in public safety downtown. Um, we've taken sort of a two-prong approach downtown. <coughs> the most obvious thing that I think people see uh, are more officers on bicycles downtown. We've uh, finally uh, fully outfitted our downtown team with nine patrol officers uh, or nine bicycle officers, a sergeant and station manager. We've been able to open our new downtown public safety station at 960 Olive. That was a, through a partnership with LCC. We're leasing space there. Um, and I think that has really afforded a good foothold for the officers, both as a, as a space to be able to conduct work, uh, reports, um, do interviews, take fingerprints, um, and then also as a drop-in station for people who are already downtown. It's not uh, at this point a full-service substation like maybe you would have experienced at Monroe or West University, um, but it is, I think, a start to getting uh, a strong public safety presence downtown. And if you think about it, um, just a very short time ago, we had two officers that were specifically assigned to downtown. And of course, the police station was downtown, but many of those officers were going to and from wherever else they had to go. And so what it's really allowed us to do is select officers who have the aptitude and the energy to work downtown um, and who have taken ownership in that, which I think really makes a big difference. Um, we're able to provide coverage with our, our new station and our officers um, from uh, Monday through Saturday. Uh, on Sundays, we don't have anybody assigned down there, but we, then we have general patrol who responds and is responsible for that area. 
And speaking of our downtown station, uh, of course, it just opened in January. Um, we put a lot of, there was a, a media blitz, and uh, we're getting ever-increasing drop-in traffic. Um, we're averaging about four to five people right now, but we strongly suspect as the weather improves, uh, we get more foot traffic and people become a little more acclimated to where we're at. Uh, we expect those numbers to rise. So I talked about sort of the two-prong approach. One is the more obvious of having more patrol officers or bicycle officers downtown um, and just having a, a more visible presence in what is our primary response area. We're, we're sort of responsible for the entire downtown, but primarily 5th to 15th, uh, High Street to Lincoln. It doesn't mean our bike officers don't go down into Midtown because they do. They also will go along the riverbank as necessary, but their primary area of ownership is that downtown core. So the other strategy is kind of behind the scenes, and that's really improving our, our collaborative efforts and partnerships with uh, many, uh, a wide array of different groups. One of those are our private public safety partners, and not a lot of people really know this, but we have a a wide network sort of in the downtown core of private public safety partners. That includes Advanced Security, which does a lot of work in the Midtown area. It includes G4S, which contracts with LTD. Uh, that includes DePaul Security that the city contracts with for, for the parking structures and some of the other areas. Uh, LCC Security. You may have seen the black and white downtown and wondered where that came from. That's actually LCC Security, and they're responsible for their, their building. Um, so what we do is we meet with these entities every two weeks, including other groups that are responsible for businesses, and it's allowed us to sort of strategize. We all tend to deal with some of the same people. It's built relationships so that our private security partners know the officers that are responsible for that particular area. We, we can share information. We can talk about problem areas. And I think beyond the fact that it's increased those relationships, it's really helped us stop uh, wasting time and be able to really focus on what are the real problem areas. Uh, we also have a bar task force that is underway. Um, we had an extremely productive meeting just a couple of Fridays ago. We had OLCC there. We had uh, owners and operators and bouncers from many of the downtown establishments. Um, and again, that helped us be able to, to build the relationships and see what, from the bar owner's perspective, they think that we can do to help them uh, to make it so that the officers recognize them and, and it was really a, a, an incredibly productive meeting. Uh, we did an operation that night, saturated the, the downtown core uh, and it was, it was again, I think extremely productive. Another thing that we're really trying to continue to afford, in some of our other substations we've had, whether it be parole and probation uh, or different groups on site, right now we don't have that, um, but we are exploring different ways to increase that partnership and, and one of them we just actually came up yesterday with was with uh, Lane County Parole and Probation. Um, and they're offering one of their parole and probation officers to actually get bicycle certified and work uh, in a patrol situation with our downtown officers. And I think there's some incredible opportunity here to utilize some of their resources and their knowledge and their skill base uh, to help our officers do their job better downtown. Uh, OLCC. We work pretty closely with them, especially on Friday nights and Saturday nights downtown. Uh, they have access to our space to be able to find a place to work on their kind of paperwork and their reports. Um, and again, they have certain tools that help us do our job more, effect uh, more effectively and more efficiently. And then again, LCC. Um, even though we don't share a space with them, we're in the same building. We meet with them also formally every two weeks, but almost Every single day we run into one of their officers and I think that relationship is only getting stronger. We've also utilized different uh, grants or uh, telecom funds to make some <coughs> technology. Um, one of them, each of our officers is outfitted with smartphones because they're not in a car and they don't have that easy access to a computer. Uh, we were able to outfit them with smartphones. It helps them not only communicate with each other efficiently, but We've provided numbers, the direct phone numbers, for a lot of our business partners in the community, and they can have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with particular officers. Uh, the officers are all also able to take photographs and collect evidence, and uh, as opposed to because they have limited space, not have to carry a separate camera and, and, and different uh, devices. The other thing that we've outfitted them with uh, are body view cameras. They're essentially in-car video for officers. So each of our nine officers and the sergeant has a camera that is on their lapel 
and it just much more accurately uh, helps us capture events as they unfold. Uh, and I think that's uh, it's been a real uh, important piece of technology for our officers. And then lastly, uh, we've also improved our collaboration with a lot of the downtown business stakeholders, um, whether it's, well, I won't name names, but we've just met with about everybody. In fact, uh, Tony Weber, who is our station manager down there, one of the things that she does routinely is go around and as each new business opens, she reaches out to them, she establishes that relationship, she provides phone numbers, uh, she encourages them to come down to the station for tours. And so I think, uh, sort of in conclusion, um, this two-prong approach of, of higher officer presence um, and the behind-the-scenes work of trying to build our relationships and more effectively collaborate with the different groups that are stakeholders downtown is making us a much more efficient unit down there. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Well, this is our new jingle. Don't you just Hi. totally love it? I can't help myself, but, you know, dance along. <laughs> uh, the new jingle this year actually is from one of our very favorites uh, in town, and you all know him. It's the Sugar Beats. And the Sugar oh, yeah. Beats wrote this just for us, as you can hear by the words. And this is not the total final. They're going into the studio this weekend for the final. But you will be hearing that, of course, as part of our promotions and on the radio. But I'm playing it a lot. I think Isaac is sick of it already. <laughs> So I um, wanted to let you know that we have a new jingle. There's so much going on downtown this year that I'm really only uh, going to inform you of the highlights. But the new jingle, we have you recognize this for sure. We've been producing this every year. It includes 40-plus free events that all of us in the city together are producing and programming. Uh, we produced 8,000 of them la last year, this year 10,000. But what's really new is that we will be producing 2,500 of them in Spanish. All right. And we came up uh, with a very, very good list for distribution and really reached out. And obviously, if you have any others that we can add, please do. We've hired a, uh, an intern or hired. She will be doing it. She speaks Spanish, and she will be helping us with the distribution. So uh, moving right along, we, you will uh, see once again uh, the Park for Lunch program. As you know, we started that last year in the, in the, in the park blocks. This during lunchtime, and this year we'll be programming on Wednesdays and Thursdays all summer long. Uh, we have done a lot of research and listened to a lot of people, and this year we will have four programs that are specifically targeting, um, inviting the child care centers. We have three child care centers, and therefore we know their parents are down here too. So there will be four specifically to that age group. Uh, we will have four drop-in fitness classes that Steve Ofterath is working on with obviously our recreation fitness instructors. And we, he's also inviting the local fitness clubs, the downtown fitness clubs like Bar 3 that you heard from Denny and the Downtown Athletic Club. We will have tables for them to promote their own businesses. So we have four of those. And then of course we're filling in with live music and visual artists and uh, there will be some painters, but I will tell you about that a little bit later. Uh, so you will see that all of our programming is is interconnected and we're doing obviously a lot of planning with my colleagues as you heard. Summer in the city downtown on Wednesdays. Uh, we're super excited of course. We're planning a fabulous summer and there will be a Eugene Sunday streets this time in downtown. Uh, Public Works Transportation Solution Office has done this program for two years now and this will be the third year and these, this has been a wonderful, wonderful event and we're super excited to have it downtown. We've worked on this for quite a while. So uh, 
we will be closing the streets, of course, and we are working with trips for kids for an obstacle course. The activity center will be at Kesey Square. It's double branded as a Eugene Sunday Streets and a Summer in the City downtown event. Live music by two local bands, a live DJ, Mecca with an art station, food carts, a beer garden. Uh, it'll just be really wonderful. Uh, along the route, an 8th and Willamette, we once again will have our temporary art project, the Park Your Art Here. This year, the, the theme is illumination, and since this is right on the route, we will be unveiling during Eugene Sunday Streets. But that's not all. On that very same day, from 8 a.m. till 11.30, we, will, we have a crit downtown, and a crit is a super fast bicycle race. We're working with Dark 30 Sports, a local company, um, and they do bike events actually because they are uh, they produce bicycle wheels. Ralph Prima, it's a manufacturer in town. So, this is a very fast bicycle race. There will be one for amateurs, one for professional, ones for women, one for kids, and there will be a workshop for women to learn how to ride crits. These are very popular events, and we hope that a lot of spectators will come out to spectate. In addition to that, there will be an elite running race, a one-miler. Elite runners uh, will be competing, and so we will see these super fast runners that we have in town right here in downtown. So that will be from 8 to 11.30. At 11.30, the route opens up for all of us to enjoy. Of course, we have more Wednesday events. The dodgeball tournament is not new, as you know. It is very, very popular, but uh, the theme is new, of course, and the theme will be Superheroes Rule, and we did that through a Facebook contest. And so we will have superheroes downtown. The week after that, we will have the movie Happy, and yes, it is a movie about happiness, and we are co-presenting that with the Bijou Metro. The week after that, we will have our probably biggest event uh, that is the fashion show all locally designed and locally made clothing what's new is that we're moving to the east park blocks we are no longer able to host that at Kesey square because it has outgrown it <laughs> and we didn't want to move our fabulous food carts so we're moving there and we also just uh, heard after a couple months of work that mobility international usa so miusa uh, will be participating with us and you will be seeing international models on the on the catwalk you know sidewalk to catwalk um, from yeah international models five to seven of them in their traditional clothing and of course these are the women that are coming in for the wild program and this is a leadership program program for women with disabilities mm -hmm. so they will be there with the traditional clothing and we're thrilled that that's gonna work out for us for all of us the last event of the season will be um, something you heard about before from Renee Gruby and Carm Hegedorn, Create Eugene. We've done a lot of work since then. This event will be double branded, just like our first one, Create Eugene and Summer in the City Downtown. Um, it, will be on, uh, it will be on a Wednesday in Kesey Square, and it's all about plein air, so painting in the outdoors. While Create Eugene, it's a month-long creative arts festival of workshops, so the entire month of August, but we will have a plein air painting track from about August 15th until the end of August. So we're really focusing on painting outdoors with workshops, competitions, uh, what's actually, I didn't know that, but it's called a paint out. So on August 21st, we'll have a paint out with two categories, cityscape and landscape. So on the 21st, you will see a lot of painters downtown painting for the cityscapes category. They will be delivering the paintings to Kesey Square at 4 o'clock, and then between 5 and 8.30, we have a very well-known judge there to judge these paintings, and then at 8.30, we'll be announcing, um, we'll be announcing a winner. What the winners? There will also bon, uh, be a category for children, for kids, and we will have an art station, of course, and live music by um, the jazz station and a wine bar, and you know, a fabulous visual arts event downtown. And uh, the paintings will then, if the artists decide to do so, move on to 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 Diva for an actual gallery show as well. And all of this is going on on Eugenia Gogo. You can't really tell from this, but. We are, everything is loaded through Eugenia Gogo and advertised to promote it through eugeniagogo.com. 
Uh, the duck prints uh, will be installed. You've heard about this before, so I just want to say that this is now in the installation. We're now installing in May and June, so you will start seeing the duck prints in the downtown area in 20 to 30 different locations that are relevant to Eugene's history. Our temporary art initiative, Isaac Marquez is working on that, and I wanted to, we will have this going on this year. It's called Art of the Box. And per our public art master plan that you may remember here, uh, it calls for more temporary art everywhere all the time. So we want to do that. <laughs> it also calls for art on everyday projects like bike corrals or traffic control boxes. You know, in traffic control boxes, they are gray. We can do something with that. In addition to, uh, to that, I want to also say that when there's art on, on a, a traffic control box, it tends to displace graffiti mm. uh, because taggers tend to tag that less, which of course then uh, saves maintenance costs. So this year's project, Art of the Box, you will see on that map that all the locations that are marked, actually all the locations that were under consideration, <coughs> where the tags are is where the public art committee chose to place um, the Art of the Box uh, artwork. So I uh, wanted to give you kind of a, a look at that and there will be two juried awards. Uh, we opened the contest at the end of May and we will have one people's choice and the people's choice one is the yellow one on the map and that is right in front of the downtown athletic club and uh, the people's choice where we're still looking for a sponsor which I'm sure somebody will come forward for such a fabulous and fun project uh, and that will be done through Facebook. So we will have a people's choice award through Facebook. And last but not least, of course, uh, construction will start for the skateboard park. We're so happy about that. And uh, it will open, uh, scheduled openings in October. And we wanted to let you know that we're already talking about events for next year. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, one more. And then just uh, even with all the fabulous things happening, um, I do want to mention just a couple of things that are still going to be coming up in front of council over the next couple of months or at least the next six months. Uh, EWeb Master Plan, uh, we'll start talking to you about that on May 15th. So we'll start the first couple of work sessions, public hearing, and then, and then moving forward with that. We've talked to you before about uh, the sale of the city property to the shed so that they can expand their business and continue investing in arts and economic development in downtown. Uh, there's, as you know, there's a committee working towards how to end the exclusion zone. That committee is working now and we expect that they'll have some recommendations that we'll be bringing back. Uh, we've had, uh, we anticipate getting a request from LTD if we haven't gotten it already to consider having uh, their property maybe be smoke free and we've had some early discussions about maybe a pilot of a larger area to just kind of see how that might go. Um, and we continue <laughs> to have some conversations around should there be some additional uh, regulations around dogs and do we need to have a policy discussion about um, downtown dogs and safety related issues with that. So these are uh, some of these not scheduled just early indicators of things we may want to keep talking about. But I think overall as you've heard the work um, you owe yourself a big congratulations because you've played a, a major role. <coughs> with this. Um, I just want to say before you start talking I did talk to Chief Groves before uh, I came up here and he said uh, a lot of the relevant information you need for him is in the memos and he can come back at a later time. So if you want to continue talking about this, you can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did want to say that I know that Grand Rapids, Michigan has a large community college in their downtown and I think and it's a, it's a non-smoking campus. So that might be, uh, might be an interesting um, experience to look at what, how, they've, how they've done with that. All right, I've got Betty and Chris in the queue. Thank you. I'm going to start at the bottom since you, since you mentioned dogs. If, if people are going to be living downtown, I think some of them may have dogs. And it would be rather, I, I hope that we, if we say people, dogs have to be licensed, that's one thing. But if you say they can't be there, that's, that's not a good thing. It's, it chases people away. I just saw a very respectable person walking a dog, a black dog at the downtown yesterday. Probably somebody I know. About. <laughs> Probably somebody you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the mayor, it was her 
family member. Yes, right. <laughs> Two family members. Two family members, right. Yes. Um, so I think that's, I, I think uh, the smoking, that, that is, that's a better way to approach better than exclusion. If you say you can't do this behavior downtown, that, that is, that makes sense because it's infringement on other people, but, and it's much better than just saying you aren't going to be here. Um, questions, um, you said fewer pesticides. Um, how about no pesticides? Someone from facilities here. Coming up. I know I have hanging baskets that I never use pesticides on them, and they don't. The, the slugs don't climb up, go through the air. Councilor Taylor, Christy Hammett, uh, Central Services yes. Director. We're still looking into the pesticide management and looking for ways to um, implement uh, reduced risk pesticides. And so Jeff Perry said he'll put <coughs> an update on that to you. So. Well, I would hope that none would be all right because really th most things can't crawl up to a hanging basket. And we're killing bees, as we all know now. There are more and more people are becoming aware of that. Uh, thank you. Um, is Broadway Place full now? It was all that retail space that's been empty. One more space on the And so they'll be paying taxes, right? They have been paying have taxes. Been paying taxes. Commercial spaces take, take okay. Taxes um, and that's been empty so much, even even when something does happen, it gets empty again soon. And when you talk about retail, uh, I, I, w I wasn't thinking of restaurants. I think of restaurants and retail. I think of a place where you can buy a pair of socks or something like that. Is that, uh, is there much, are you, do you have hopes for much of what I call retail? <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, you know, we've looked at other areas um, and, uh, you know, other cities, and one of the things that I think is pretty consistent is that food typically leads that transformation. Uh, we're starting to see some retail. For example, I, I referenced the lumber company. There's a cosmetics company. There's a women's clothing store. Um, some of the property owners are actually acknowledging that I may be holding out and passing on restaurants in cases where they would want to see um, uh, traditional retail clothing and goods and, and so forth. So um, I think, um, I, I hope we're on a, on a path that some of that other more traditional retail is coming. We're seeing some of it at least initially. You should be able to buy a box of Band-Aids, a screwdriver. If you're going to live down there, it would be nice to walk out and get Absolutely. some little necessities that... Yes. Uh, City Hall, of course, is a black mark on downtown currently and I hope we're not hope that things will be moving ahead on that it looks worse and worse this was farmers market we had five hundred thousand dollars set aside to help farmers market I think and they it is one of the most active things downtown has been all these years and brings many many people of all kinds well, people who like good food, maybe not all kinds. But, uh, and um, we haven't done anything about that yet. I know there's a, some kind of movement to move the farmer's market to the Fifth Street Market, and I also know that a lot of the farmers definitely want to stay where they are. So my question is, if the board decides that they want to move up to the Fifth Street Market parking lot, can the people who have been there long uh, for many years and want to stay where they are, will they be able to stay? <laughs> oh, that's, a, um, that's probably a deeper question than I can answer on the fly like that, because I'm not sure what all the ramifications are. I think we want them to stay there. The uh, urban renewal funds are specific for improvements for the farmer's market and the park block, so the funds will remain, and th those won't travel any place outside of, of the park block. So um, that you know, who stays and who goes. Uh, we're working with the farmer's market and the Saturday market right now and um, trying to make sure that if they choose to stay here that they have everything they need to do that. From what I hear, the ones who've been there and kept it going for 20 or more years really like where they are and they don't mind if the others move away. Betty, I need to get your turns up. We'll keep I you updated on how that progresses. I did see that red light, but I just... Um, just ignored it. <laughs> just ignored it. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. I have another, I'd like another round. Okay. <laughs> Chris. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is incredible. Um, a tremendous, tremendous uh, presentation on a tremendous um, amount of activity going on. And I realize we as a council have given you um, the authority to do it, but the work has been done by you and, and by all the folks that are here. And I'm incredibly impressed with the staff at the City of Eugene who have bent over backwards to try to make this work. Um, not only from uh, the development standpoint, from the public safety standpoint, and from the public events and activity standpoint, um, and, and all the other things. And this partnership, I think, really demonstrates how you can make downtowns come back. And if you think of this as our home, our downtown is our living room. And we had a pretty shabby living room for a very long time. And now we have a living room where I'm proud to invite people into our home and say, this is, this is our home. Um, and the fact that we have done this in partnership with a lot of other folks, including the people who have provided the developments, the retail, uh, the activities and events, demonstrates that no one person or no one group can do this alone. You really do have to do it together. Um, we watched downtown wither for too many years. And now we are watching downtown resurge in a way that I didn't know would happen or could happen uh, this soon or this quickly. And for that reason, um, we are proud to have been able to provide the authority, but we are equally proud that you have provided the initiative and the effort and the creativity to make something like this happen. And I'm confident that this momentum will continue when you talk about some of the future things that are going on. Um, I'm confident that once we begin to get that critical mass going, uh, it will keep going. And from that standpoint, I think we've all been successful and we've all succeeded. Thank you. Thank you. George Bowling. Well, I too would like to echo what Chris said about all the hard work that all the staff has done on the direction that basically council has given. Uh, but I think a bigger thanks needs to go to the business community, the developers, and particularly the, the businesses that have stuck it out during the hard times and the, the down times in downtown. And to the, the ones that are coming in or opening up new businesses to have faith in the vision that we have of what we would like to see our downtown. So they deserve a, a, as big, if not a bigger thanks. I, you know, I hate to split it up that way, but, you know, they take, they're taking some financial risks that a lot of people were afraid to take uh, just a few years ago. And also, a lot of this couldn't have been done without some of the incentives that the city has had to offer. I know at times they can be offered debt. What was the word I was looking for? Controversial. Controversial, thank you. <laughs> but without things like the urban renewal districts and the MUPTIs, a lot of these things would not have been built. So it's, it's a, a giant effort by a lot of uh, different entities, different people, and, you know, I, for the, this is my 11th year on the council. When I first came on the council in 2003, we were talking about, well, what can we do to make downtown better? It, it's taken a while, but boy, once it started, it, it has really gone, uh, you know, just taken off. And um, I'm just really pleased with what I'm seeing going on down there. Clear? Yeah, thank you. And I echo what Councilor Pauling just said. I, I really appreciate the energy, the collaboration, the hard work, the creative thinking. Um, it's very, very exciting and uh, really very impressive and I think a great model for what we can do together in this community when we put our minds to it. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of thoughts. I uh, agree with Councillor Taylor. I was wondering if downtown dogs was a special breed of dog that we were worried about. <laughs> Um, you know, we want people to live and work downtown, and people have pets, and we need to accommodate those pets. And, and I understand there's a specific public safety issue that that's trying to address, but we just need to remember the broader context of, of the community that we're in. Uh, since you guys put the slide up about the Washington Jefferson Skate Park, which I'm very excited about, I'm uh, really looking for a way to try to designate that as a smoke-free park. So that is um, something that I'm interested in, so I'm very interested in the smoke-free areas conversation. Um, thank you so much for creating our brochure in Spanish. That is fantastic and that is uh, a tangible um, uh, demonstration of us fulfilling our pledge to become a more welcoming community for our immigrant families and neighbors. So that's fantastic to see. Um, I had some questions on the public safety piece. Um, I know you and you said the LCC uh, stations not a fully staffed 
station in the way maybe the Monroe station was. And I did want to note that Tony came to the Downtown Neighborhood Association meeting, I think, along with her supervisor, and that was very much appreciated that they came and answered questions and just gave an update. Um, but I was a little concerned that sometimes that station has to basically shut down if um, the one staff person has to take a lunch break or if she wants to take a vacation day or something. Um, and then you talked about the Monday through Saturday coverage for downtown. What are the hours that those that coverage happens? <clears throat> well, we have two officers who work essentially a day shift Monday through Thursday. And then we have three officers that work what we term third watch, so that's from 11 in the morning till 9 at night. And they work, uh, well, two of them work uh, Monday through Thursday and, and two of them work Wednesday through Saturday. And then we have three officers that work our late watch, 5 p.m. to 3 a.m. They work from Wednesday through Saturday, um, and primarily their focus, of course, Friday and Saturday is uh, the heart of downtown and, and the bars. And so. Right. Yeah. Um, and then you mentioned uh, parole and probation officer m may be coming to join or is going to. Well, we, we, this discussion actually just came up yesterday. We met with a wide array of people, including parole and probation, and I understand they're undergoing some, some changes within their own organization, but they're, they're funded differently um, than other Lane County. Uh, they get their state funding, and, and what I was led to believe is that they are actually um, in really good financial shape. They're actually hiring some parole and pro, uh, probation officers, and one of their ideas because um, we've had collaborative efforts with them at different substations where they were actually housed out of a substation and they would see clients there. Uh, we're not really looking at that model right now, but a model that they suggested and one that I think is really worth exploring further is actually having one of their officers be bicycle certified and working hand in hand with our officers downtown. Uh, so again, it was just an idea that was brought up yesterday, but uh, and I have yet to actually have an opportunity to run it up the flagpole, but one I think is very exciting and worthwhile exploring further. Um, so rather than take up time here, I, if, if that gets further developed, I'd just be curious to have a little more detail on how that officer would support the other public safety efforts, like specifically what they would be doing. Absolutely. Um, and then my, I guess my last comment question is, oh, two things actually, <coughs> OLCC um, involvement, that's great to hear that they're part of this conversation and just wondering if we've revisited the malt liquor sales issue with the corner stores in downtown, if that's part of that conversation. Uh, it is part of that conversation. We're still in the pretty early stages of talking about, you know, the banning or, or even the voluntary restriction of fortified uh, wines and alcohol, um, but it is an ongoing conversation, yes. And in the legislature. Okay. And then my last uh, question was just to Denny. Uh, I noticed the picture of the barn light. It looked like there was a lot of bicycles, par bicycles parked out there, and I just wanted to check in about bike parking and if we have enough, if it's sufficient. Are we thinking about that as a way to encourage people to come downtown without their cars? We, we're actually looking at a lot of things. We're kind of at the beginning and stages, and now that, again, now that we've have all of these development projects, retail projects, the next layer really is to start to look how, peop how people experience downtown. So that's looking at downtown seating, bicycle parking, landscaping, uh, cleanliness, all of those things. Um, and we've just started that work. So it is part of the scope within that scope, yes. Great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Alan, did you have anything you wanted to say? Yes, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment on... Um, when I got in the council, uh, downtown wasn't looking very good, and, and we've instituted a lot of policies and done a lot of incentives, including using the Urban Renewal District and MUPTI and the loan programs. To, and the thought behind all that was to kickstart the development and, and, and get a synergistic effect to get more stuff downtown and, and hopefully revitalize it. And all of that actually has. I think we, it worked, and I think we... Uh, should celebrate that. Now, I wanted to say congratulations and thank you not only to the staff, but the businesses downtown and all the investors that have, have seen the, uh, what we saw early, which is downtown has a lot of potential, a lot of vision of, of, for it to be a really vibrant place. Um, I, I know, you, Danny, you mentioned 1,500 residents and at least 20 new businesses. Do you have a total amount of money invested in downtown in the last several years? I know at one point it was like 180 million. That's probably a lot more than that now. Yeah, I think we're uh, we've uh, probably um, breached the 200 million dollar mark. Um, 
And, um, you know, our investment uh, to make that $200 million happen, of course, has been pretty significant as well. But as far as the overall investment, it's, it's uh, definitely approaching about $200 million. Yeah, again, thanks for all that stuff. And, and also, all the event, I think all the stuff that we do uh, around the events downtown and the stuff that um, the Parks and Rec and all those folks do, it really helps to make downtown a much more appealing place for all types of people and family members and, and dog walkers. Um, and so I think that that's helped a lot, too. So it's all those things combined that has uh, made downtown a, a, a place to... Uh, to, to invest and live. So, good job. Thanks. <clears throat> I just wanted to also say thank you. And I actually, what I appreciate is that you've kept all these pieces going at the same time. And that's really important because there's something where they kind of all start out separately, but they're sort of synergistic to making the whole move. So I just am appreciative of all the work that you all have done. And I wanted to bring up again what I heard from the uh, folks who are uh, at Interactive, which you pointed out is one of the uh, fastest moving companies in the country. And uh, they specifically said how excited they were to be downtown, that they felt it was, it was it, the kind of place they wanted to be and the kind of activity that they wanted to be part of. Uh, and that they basically offered to, t to put that message out into the world because they, that's what attracted them to, uh, to locating in, in our downtown. And then the three guys that they hired there, the first thing they asked about was dodgeball. <laughs> so, um, and the, uh, their their thing was they wanted to be downtown where the action is and where the summer in the city was going to happen. So I thought both of those were, were very strong messages that were uh, headed in the right direction. This morning I heard when I was over at Broadway Place about more folks coming in and looking at some of the few remaining places that are still open because they want to be part of the buzz down downtown. So that's all. That's all really good. And then I wanted to say I think this fashion thing with Mayus is just wonderful because part of what we take pride in is not only being a good fun city but being having everything be accessible to everyone and having these these wonderful women who come from all over the country to learn about an accessible city and that they get to while they're here participate in a fashion show. That is just awesome. It's really, really healthy, really good. And um, I'm... Um, I appreciate that everybody admires our farmer's market and would like to have it go here, there, and other places, but um, I would love for it to, to stay in the vibrant center of our downtown if we can figure out how to make that work. And um, the I've said this to the chief, and I, I'll just put this in your ear. Um, I think that um, a lot of what we deal with in terms of behavioral issues and things like that downtown um, and around the edges of downtown, that we would be far better off if our first approach was kind of a, a uh, team approach, that where we where we were able to send a team of uh, law enforcement and health and social services out together, so that we weren't that we would respond at the front end of something with sort of a, an approach of a problem solving approach, as opposed to asking our law enforcement folks to be the the, uh, the key response. So I, I think they're a piece of it. Definitely, and you want everybody to be safe. But I just, am, uh, if we can find a way to do it that we can afford, I really think that notion of a team that goes out because then if you agree on a strategy, you share that responsibility. It's not just one part of one one part of the organization um, saying that's it, that's the response. It's everybody saying this is the best thing that we think from a social service and health and uh, public safety point of point of view. Yeah, that was three minutes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Well, I waited to the end. <laughs> no, no. I noticed the clock, so I looked at mine. Anyway. You'd want me to do that. I would want you to do that. In order to. Yeah. I just, <laughs> and I'm all for, although I'm not saying this name, but I am going to say, you know, I think it's, if anybody's interested in locating a Walgreens-type place in our uh, downtown, that seems like it would hit it on a lot of marks. So I'm just, just saying. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.